Good afternoon, and thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This event is part of the China series sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. This afternoon, we will speak, be speaking with Mr. Peter Husey. Mr. P Peter Husey is president of his own defense consulting firm, Geostrategic Analysis, founded in 1981 and, six, two, and since 2016, director of strategic deterrence studies at the Mitchell Institute on Aerospace Studies. He was a senior defense consultant at the National Defense University Foundation for 22 years. He was the National Security Fellow at the AFPC and senior defense consultant at the Air Force Association from 2011. Mr. Husey has served as an expert defense and national security analyst for over 45 years, helping his clients cover congressional activities while monitoring budget and policy developments on terrorism, counterterrorism, immigration, state-sponsored terrorism, missile defense, weapons of mass destruction, especially U.S.-Israeli joint defense efforts, nuclear deterrence, arms control, proliferation, as well as tactical and strategic air, airlift, space, and nuclear matters, and such state and non-state actors as North Korea, China, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, and Hezbollah, Hamas, and Al-Qaeda. This also includes monitoring activities of think tanks, non-governmental organizations, and other U.S. government departments, as well as projecting future actions of Congress in this area. His specialty is developing and implementing public policy campaigns to secure support for important national security objectives. Mr. Husey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hannah, and thank John Lenkowski for inviting me to speak. I want to just say to everybody, this is a lecture on how China's nuclear strategy and policy fits within overall Chinese uh, foreign policy and strategic goals. I first want to start with um, Les Aspen, the former chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and a mentor of mine, and then became Secretary of Defense, said that we spend a lot of time concentrating on what he called the nuclear beams. What he meant was the things you can count. These are submarines, these are missiles, these are ICBMs, bombers, and warheads. And his point was, don't tell me how many beams the bad guys have. Tell me why they have what they have, what they now have that they didn't have a year or so ago, so that we can then determine what are they going to do with these new beings? And the question with China, the emphasis has been historically on, well, they only have 20 warheads, or they only have 60 warheads, or they only have 280, as opposed to what are the nuclear technologies they're acquiring, and what do they want to do with them? And the second issue is deterrence had generally looked upon the way Paul Nitze used to tell me, as he said, he doesn't want the Russians to sit at their desks at the strategic rocket forces and determine that they could take out our nuclear forces and not risk retaliation. And he wanted the rocket forces commander to look at these issues every day on a computer and say, not today, comrade, meaning it makes no sense to use nuclear weapons. The problem is we're in a little different world. And that world is started by Mr. Putin 15 years ago to what he called escalate to win or use nuclear weapons or threaten to use nuclear weapons in a coercive or blackmail way in a crisis or in a conventional conflict to up the ante and get the United States to disarm by standing down. Uh, one senior military official who I've worked with put it this way in a workshop we had recently. He said what they wanted to do is, let's say they wanted to go into the Baltics and they were successful in doing that and getting the U.S. to stand down because they threatened the use of nuclear weapons. And then the Russians would say to the rest of NATO, you, the United States, declare yourself the leader of the free world and the head of NATO. You can't even defend your allies. And therefore, you should make an accommodation with us in Moscow in order to, uh, we'll, we'll help you out and provide the security you need to do. So that's the first point and second point. Now, we mainly think of China in terms of 
its economic challenges to us. And this reminds me of a briefing I had down at Salcom uh, in Florida in 2016 in the summer, in which the commanding uh, officer who gave me the brief was the deputy there, and he happened to have been an old nuclear weapons Air Force uh, official who I knew quite well. And he laid out what the Chinese were up to at that time in Central and South America. And that was the following six steps that they took. One was they provide a lot of money, free money, to these countries to buy Chinese goods. It'd be over a billion dollars, mamibis. And they could purchase just Chinese goods with it. The second thing is they'd make a quid pro quo. They say, in return, we would like to build your port infrastructure and your railroad lines and shipping lines to your ports. And then what would happen is they often, the countries wouldn't be able to pay the money back. And the Chinese would say, well, we have a deal here. We would like to control and build your banking system and your IT, your internet system, so that the Chinese would control a nation's trade, investment, banking, and information. That's quite a combination. And the roads and belts program that the Chinese have been doing now is basically aimed exactly that. So in that context, the question then is most people don't talk about nuclear weapons or Chinese military capability because they see it by me as an economic challenge. The thing is the economic challenge is very, very much connected to the economic challenge. I have an automatic lighting system in my office, which just a minute, get up and turn back on, my apologies. And so I look at what are the military objectives the Chinese have, uh, as well as their economic objectives. First one is they want the United States out of the Republic of Korea. They also would like to reduce American forces in Japan. They would also like to eliminate as much as possible American support for and cooperation with the Republic of China or Taiwan. They would also, and are doing this, blackmailing countries within Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific to basically ally themselves with the Chinese in terms of port facilities, infrastructure, trade and investment, as well as not cooperating with the United States militarily. Uh, this again mimics what they were doing in Central and Latin America, which SOCOM briefed me about in 2016. Then following the economic infrastructure will be military bases. We've seen that in places like Djibouti, though they're not called military bases. And then the question is how then do the Chinese use nuclear policy on top of that? And that is you proliferate nukes, and we'll get to this, you proliferate nukes to Pakistan, for example, to counter India, nukes to the North Koreans in order to split the US and Iraq alliance. And I, am a minority in this business, but I believe that China does not see nuclear weapons in Iran as a problem because, as the Prime Minister of Israel has pointed out, the JCPOA is not a prohibition on Iran getting nuclear weapons. It's a blueprint and a pathway to get there because, as General Hayden, former DNI, has said, the JCPOA is a blueprint for Iran getting an industrial strength nuclear capability to build weapons when they decide to do so. And Iran then would replace the United States, Egypt, Israel, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as the regional alliance in that part of the world that protects our interests. So with that context, I wanna go back to the issue of how we have used, viewed China's nuclear program in what I call a conventional wisdom. First, we were told, and it's basically I say that Chinese can't, won't, wouldn't, or aren't. First is they can't build large numbers of nuclear weapons because they don't have enough enriched uranium or they don't have enough plutonium, which they can reprocess. The second thing is the Chinese will not develop maneuverable or multi-warheads, that their missiles are primarily single warhead. Third issue is China will never use nuclear weapons first. Fourth. China is not only can't build nuclear weapons greater than they now have, but they're not interested in building nuclear we more nuclear weapons because they have a minimal deterrent strategy, which means they will go after our cities, but not after our military capability. 
and going after our cities, you need relatively few warheads. And finally, China's nuclear weapons are solely to deter, and this they've recently said in some uh, Chinese statements to their uh, media organs, they have said, we're only here to stop US bullying and a hostile policy. Now, let's look at what, in each of those five points, what the issues are. They say they can't build large numbers of nuclear weapons. They said that when they had 20, supposedly, and then 60 warheads, and now they have somewhere around 300, at least that's the number, official number that we think they have. They haven't actually told us what they have, but they're on their way to doubling to around 700. So obviously, if they can't build, they are. Now, they won't develop multiple and maneuver warheads. Well, they are. They're putting multiple warheads on their missiles, having developed it through what we often heard described in the media as peaceful space technology. They say they won't use nuclear weapons first, and the head of STRATCOM, Admiral Charles Richard, was asked about this by Senator Inhofe, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, in hearings in February of this year. And he said, well, you can drive a truck through the loopholes in the Chinese statements about not using nuclear weapons first, and we'll come back to that. The other issue was China is not interested in building more nuclear weapons, and yet the recent statement from the Chinese have said that they're not only interested in building nuclear weapons, they would like to go up to a thousand. Then the next day they came out and said, well, that wasn't official. We really aren't going to a thousand, but obviously according to the DNI and to the uh, intelligence services in the US, they definitely are going to the six to 700 level. And this idea about China only seeking to stop the United States from bullying, it's exactly what the North Koreans have said for years that the reason they have nuclear weapons is because the United States has a hostile policy towards North Korea. I find that fascinating in that if you, I asked the head of the, former head of the CIA, Jim Woolsey, and then I also asked another head of the CIA who was in a, in a different administration, has the United States used military force against North Korea since the end of the Korean War? The answer of course is no. And the question is how many times has North Korea use military force or terrorist attacks against Japan, the United States, or South Korea, for example? And the answer to that is hundreds of times, including the cross-border terrorist attacks that the North Koreans are famous for uh, on the peninsula. And the question is that the hostile policy is obviously one of North Korea towards the United States, Japan, and South Korea, not the other way around. So, but China has adopted that. The other thing that's fascinating to me is the conventional wisdom of how China has, in its policies and its rhetoric, has basically echoed the disarmament lobby. For example, China says that it has a no first use policy, exactly what has been proposed by the disarmament community that America adopt. Uh, the Chinese say they have only a minimal deterrent, that their deterrent is for retaliation only, that they have warheads that are in the megaton class but nothing um, smaller. Accuracy is therefore unimportant. Uh, they're not going for a triad. They have a city busting strategy. They're just trying to stop the US bullying. And as the Chinese have said over and over again, we don't proliferate nuclear technology. Now this is what the Chinese say or what the arms control, excuse me, the disarmament lobby says. What's fascinating to me is the positions are identical, which I think is quite interesting in terms of their positions. Now, what's the record? Let's start with, instead of going right to where Chinese nuclear strategy is today, what about historically? I would reference people to Tom Reed's book, The Nuclear Express. And he quotes Deng Xiaoping in an internal Chinese document saying that they made a dis conscious decision in 1982 to arm their allies with nuclear weapons technology, despite a senior Chinese official saying, at the time, in response to an inquiry from the Reagan administration, because as you know, Tom Reed was deputy national security advisor to President Reagan, as well as previously being secretary of the Air Force. The Chinese official said, I'm quoting, China will never proliferate nuclear weapons technology to other countries, end of quote. In fact, they proliferated ballistic missile and nuclear weapons technology to a number of nations in the Muslim and Marxist world, including a nuclear facility to Algeria, what Tom Reed calls a full dose of nuclear support 
to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea, centrifuges through Malaysia to Libya, and a nuclear warhead and then weapons to Pakistan. That's on page 249 of Tom Reed's book. What's also interesting is that on 254, Tom details the Chinese delivering of technology, nuclear technology to Libya, Iran, and Iraq. That's on page 254 through the Khan network, which I call the Pakistani nukes are us uh, group. So the Chinese definitely got away with nuclear murder. And I also would like to reference Bill Gertz's book, Deceiving the Sky. And here are six examples of five of which have to do with the transfer of technology or the theft of technology or warhead blueprints by the Chinese, while at the same time they were saying they had no interest in such things. For example, their new missiles kept blowing up on the pad and they weren't able to launch satellites and they got help on guidance technology, which guess what? Allowed them not only to apply it to their satellite launching capability, but to their ICBMs. What's also interesting is today under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, China is one of the major recipients to get from the fund that the United States would pay into to develop new green technologies, as if an economy that is supposedly somewhere between 13 and 14 trillion dollars a year should be getting benefits from the United States like foreign aid as if it was a third world country. But we still think of China, if you look at some of the rhetoric and some of the analytical writing by the academic community as a third world country. Another thing we did is they adopted uh, what was called a dispenser technology that they got for launching uh, satellites, which is basically an ASAT system, which is also the first thing you need to have a boost, a post boost vehicle for multiple warheads. So those are three instances where they either got what technology from us, uh, a US company, contrary to law, or they stole it. Also, what's quite interesting is if you look at the EMP commission reports and the testimony of Peter Pry, the Chinese developed plans that were published about using a nuclear weapon in an EMP attack over the Western Pacific which would be the first use of nuclear weapons in a conflict, number one, and number two, using them uh, for attack. The other thing was, as Bill Kurtz pointed out, between 2010, 11, and 12, the Chinese had not only a massive buildup in nuclear and conventional technology, but a lot of it was from stolen technology, some of which was stolen from the United States. And finally, he points out in his book that the PRC stole the designs for six nuclear warheads, including the United States W-88 that we deploy on the D-5 submarine launched ballistic missiles that are small in size and are critical to something that the Chinese would wanna build if they were building a submarine launched ballistic missile fleet, which they are now doing. The next thing I wanna talk about is what about, the, what are the, what I call the Chinese breadcrumbs, the nuclear breadcrumbs, which would give you an idea of what they're up to. We're told repeatedly within the disarmament literature is the Chinese keep their nuclear warheads separate from their ballistic missiles, their bombers, and their submarines, which would indicate that they have no intent of launching these things first. But then again, they would only launch them after a long period of time after being attacked. But the problem is, you don't build submarines and send them to sea if they have no warheads on the missiles. And one of the things that Phil Carber and I, when we were looking at the Chinese uh, underground tunnels, where they built 3,000 kilometers of tunnels in which they hid their ballistic missiles, we tried to figure out and were successful in finding out uh, how much would it cost if we did that, or if we hired the Chinese What's interesting is the Israelis hired a group of Chinese from the 21st Artillery, which built these tunnels, and they hired them to do some tunneling and got a cost. And it figured when you do the numbers, it would have cost, uh, the Chinese would have charged to do it about 65 to $70 billion. Well, you, don't, you don't spend 65 to $70 billion, which is the equivalent of basically twice our annual budget on nuclear deterrence that we in the United States spend. You don't spend that kind of money 
if you're in a minimal deterrent, solely retaliatory capability. Plus, what's interesting, a launch pads outside the tunneling, which was identified through Google Maps, is exactly the kilometers from, uh, from these areas in China to three military bases in the United States of America called Maelstrom, Minot, and F.E. Warren. Why would the Chinese target our ICBM Minuteman three bases if they have a policy of simply going after our cities in a city busting or what is known as a counter value deterrent policy? The second, uh, the next thing is China is developing a complete triad, it's, which is quite interesting. And when you look at the panoply of number of missiles they're building, mobile and fixed land-based ICBMs, strategic bombers, and submarines. They're going for the full Monty with respect to uh, nuclear capability. So that's a far cry from a minimal deterrent and a only a city-busting capability. Now, what does this mean for Chinese nuclear strategy? One uh, pundit once said that all of us who are looking at Chinese nuclear strategy and the nuclear beans, as I call them, we're debating among ourselves because the Chinese don't say a lot. But recently, what's fascinating is the Chinese have instead revealed some of what their policies are. And that is they're moving towards what I consider a Putin-like strategy of escalate to win in a regional crisis about threatening the use of nuclear weapons early, uh, using coercion and blackmail to get what they want. Uh, this is obvious when you read some of their fairly extensive comments about if Taiwan gets off the reservation and they said they reserve the right to use nuclear weapons first against Taiwan and to incorporate Taiwan by force into the Chinese mainland. And this is also kind of a, a very, very important point because it mirrors Putin's argument with respect to the Baltics and countries in Eastern Europe that he has a right to incorporate them into the a new Russian empire, so to speak. And this does not mean that the Chinese have not also dramatically expanded their conventional capability. And recently we saw, saw there's an article written about, oh, this is China just simply wants to prevent the United States from dominating a particular area. Disagree. What China is looking to do is preventing the United States from coming to the defense of our allies in Korea or Japan or Taiwan or in the Middle East, where the Chinese and Russians, as my friend uh, Dr. B Stephen Blank has pointed out, have continued to cooperate quite extensively in the military area. The Chinese want to prevent us from coming to the defense of our allies and our friends. They call that deterrence. Deterrence in most Americans' mind, meaning preventing someone from attacking you in the first place. It doesn't mean per preventing you from coming to the defense of your friends that have been attacked in the first place by the Chinese. So the Chinese turn upside down by 360 degree, the whole notion of deterrence and what nuclear weapons are for, which are to, to deter an attack in the first place, as opposed to an umbrella under which the Chinese feel they could safely attack our allies, whether it's Taiwan or South Korea or Japan, without fear of retribution. Now, the issue then is what would the Chinese might be up to that we have to worry about? Uh, here again, these are excursions which could happen. I think we need to look at it seriously. One is that the Chinese recently, with respect to the global pandemic, have said that the United States is too weak to be a leader of the free world. They've doubled down on the idea that globalism is great and it's the United States system that doesn't work. Uh, Zachariah, uh, one of the panda huggers in this country has laid out that philosophy. And, but another thing that's quite interesting is a leaked memo from the Chinese Politburo. And again, this is a, a supposed memo written by a member says that when the United States finds out what the Chinese have done with respect to releasing the uh, pandemic flu on the, excuse me, the pandemic virus on us by not preventing it from leaving Wuhan. Once they find out about this, there will be a military conflict, predicts this person. So then the question is, you have to look at that in the context of the new Chinese military capability, both conventional 
and nuclear. And this raises the next point is, do the Chinese move up their planned uh, hegemonic strategy? Because the timeline, according to Mike Pillsbury, was that in 2048, 100th anniversary of the Chinese taking over of um, the mainland, uh, they would declare themselves to be the leader of the free world, excuse me, the leader of the world uh, militarily and economically and politically. Are they going to move that timetable up because they think we are distracted by the coronavirus as is other countries uh, being distracted? And will they use the nuclear forces they have now and the conventional forces they have now in moving toward a more reckless or less risk averse uh, foreign and security policy, which worries me. Uh, and I think we have to take seriously. So in that context, um, I think I would look at the Chinese nuclear strategy as getting closer to that of Mr. Putin and the, the Russians. Uh, it is certainly not the minimalist retaliatory only city busting policy, which we have uh, grown accustomed to thinking uh, when you when you look at the comments by the disarmament community here in America, this is a much more serious uh, threat than we have seen before. So with that, uh, Hannah, I will finish my opening remarks and take any questions from you or the audience. Perfect. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in. We have one here from Christian D. Orr. He goes, my question is uh, for you is, given the fact that China has electromagnetic pulse attack as part of its anti-US war plans, how likely is it in your professional that you should, where war break out being that the US and the PRC, that Beijing would employ an EMP strike against America as opposed, or perhaps even in conjunction with an air burst or ground burst nuclear weapon strike against our nation? I think uh, someone who worked very closely on an EMP with members of Congress and particularly my friend, Peter Pry and uh, Bill Graham. Bill Graham, you know, was the president's science advisor when President Reagan was in the White House. And Peter works for the EMP task force on Capitol Hill and also was critically uh, important to the creation of the EMP commissions that met twice. I think that this is a, um, it's a simple attack. You may not know where it comes from. You could do it on a freighter off the coast of North Carolina, 400 miles off, launch a nuclear warhead uh, armed missile 70 kilometers above uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And given the cascading impact of shutting down the grid, you could knock out everything from basically Philadelphia and New York down to Atlanta. Again, there are some critics who say, oh, no, no, it would be just localized, it would be like a hurricane. Okay, well, then use three weapons. It's not like they don't have them. And I would think that that would be a precursor. The issue then is what about that kind of an airburst uh, 70 miles up? It has no debris, so you don't know where it's from, it has no fingerprints, so to speak, no nuclear forensic fingerprints. And it would ba basically mean we couldn't use the East Coast to disembark our military capability. And that would be an enormous impact if we had to send stuff to the Middle East or other just out of the Pacific. So your questioner's uh, uh, comment is very, very apropos. That's why I think we need to harden our grid from A to Z. Look, you can do two things. You can harden it against the sun, which is a natural EMP, or you can do it for nuclear weapons or be smart and do it for both. The cost is somewhere between six and $7 billion for the major part of the 3,000 transformers we're talking about. The benefit is if you go to the electric utility business and ask them, aren't there natural EMP that occurs every day? They say yes. And I said, what's the, I asked them, what's the cost? And they said, the cost is about 1% to 2% of the cost of electricity in America. What's 1% to 2% of the cost of electricity in America that they have to pay for wholesale? $8 billion. I said, you would then save $8 billion a year, every year, if you implemented protecting your transformers and you wouldn't have to worry about the natural occurring EMP. And they said, yes. Well, if you can save $8 billion, a chimpanzee can figure out that a 20 year bond is gonna pay you what? 
save you eight billion, which is going to be put back in the grid to protect it. And then every year thereafter, I can be very creative in where I want to send that money. I would send it all around the country to build smart grids. I would all send it around the country to have people uh, put uh, electrical systems in place that are actually what people have noticed is green. Well, if they're more efficient, I don't care what you call it, if you use less electricity, and you could put a lot of money into some very creative things in the energy business. So my view, it's a win-win-win across the board, and we should do it because I know the electric utility industry felt put upon with comments about you know global warming and they thought they're going to regulate it to death. This is where they can actually make money for the community of which they're part, protect the grid, and basically deflect any EMP type attacks on the United States. We have another question here from Dr. Lawrence Guido. Both Russia and China are ramping up military north of the Arctic Circle. Can you comment on that threat to America? Yes, it's very good. One of the questions that came up during the Senate Armed Services Committee hearings recently, and particularly the uh, senators from uh, Alaska, were very interesting, is if you look at what's going on with the ice flows during the summer, where they recede, you can launch a missile from the Arctic area into the United States very fast because you don't have the extension of the ice flows, which you have uh, have had traditionally, plus in the winter, they do ex uh, expand greatly. So that's number one problem. The Russians are building uh, points along through the Arctic where they would take care of tankers and commercial traffic because if you go through the Arctic, uh, to get freight from one side of the world to the other, you dramatically less than the cost. Now, you don't can't do it year-round, but the Chinese are also, interestingly, they are saying they are an Arctic power. The last time I looked, China doesn't border on the Arctic, but there are also indications the Chinese and Russians are cooperating. We are way behind the eight ball on this one. We are moving in the right direction. But we have to develop not only capability to operate in that area, but also capability to def deter and defend that area. And that uh, Senator Sullivan from Alaska should be given high grades for raising this issue. And our, our military and our Coast Guard and others have said, yes, this is a serious issue. And it's just part of the maritime region around the United States, of which we have thousands and thousands of miles, which we have not generally protected, for example, you can launch a missile from the Gulf of Mexico. We have no radars pointed in that direction, which is why uh, our military and Congress have agreed and the administration to build space-based sensors so we can see such weapons coming at us, particularly if they're hypersonic speed, which gives you very little time to catch them coming at you and figuring out where they're going. So it's a good question. It's not talked about very often, but the Arctic is right there albeit it's on the other side of Canada, but in terms of kilometers to some target in the United States, it's much shorter than it was, is if you were launching something from the mainland in Russia or the mainland in China. Another question here from Robert Alberts. What non-nuclear military technologies and equipment are China acquiring to truly challenge the U.S. military in the near term? Well, their ASAT capability is not nuclear. Uh, their launching of the ASAT Capability is that basically they parallel the flight of a satellite and then reach out with a claw and they can grab it. Now, they said what they're doing is cleaning up space debris, or they were basically reorienting the satellite to put it in a new direction. But what is one person's, oh, we're just correcting the uh, trajectory of a, of a satellite is grabbing your satellite and taking it out. Uh, certainly, cyber attacks and using artificial intelligence to do that, that's a very major issue. And again, um, this is something we have been behind the eight ball. Because remember, at the end of the Cold War, for almost 20 some years, we went on what General Heron said called a procurement holiday. And he was talking particularly about nuclear, but it was everything. We basically kicked the can down the road until we have basically run out of road. And across the board, whether it's hypersonic, speed capabilities of weapon systems, or whether it's EMP, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's uh, cyber, these are things that are the bad guys are doing a lot of work. They stole, they steal what, 300 to $600 billion 
of American business technology every year, according to the former head of the NSA, uh, Keith Alexander, the general spoke at NDU when I was there at a dinner I hosted in 2009. And he had, we had 45 aerospace industry executives. And he said, you don't know this, but you're being stolen blind by the Chinese. And all of them, you could see their faces kind of turn white saying, well, well they didn't know this. They thought if they had the regular call up Kapersky or somebody to protect their internet systems. And General Alexander pointed out, uh, no, you're not being protected. So the Chinese are very smart fellows. Now, I think they're criminal enterprise masquerading as a country, but nonetheless, uh, they are very serious about becoming the world's hegemon in 2048. We have a question here from Dr. John Lynchowski, who is the founder and president of the Institute of World Politics. He goes, the Trump administration is saying that new start can't be renewed if China is excluded. Should we be working for a new arms control regime, even with China, in light of the fact that three decades of arms control grossly ill served our national security, and that arms control have been seen by the Russians as a theater of political warfare, not cooperation? I agree 100% with John, as he knows. Uh, the exception to that was the INF Treaty and START One. The problem with New START is the verification measures are inadequate. You can only have one inspection for one missile type per year. Well, let's say you go and you inspect the missile and it's got six warheads. Well, it's not illegal. The Russians can have as many warheads as they want on any kind of system. The question is we, we assume implicitly that if they have 100 missiles and each of them have maybe six, they got 600 warheads. But we don't know that because you can only inspect. Plus, you have no portal monitoring, meaning you can't monitor the exit to a factory of where they're producing this stuff. There are a whole lot of reasons why the New START Treaty verification measures don't measure up to the START one measures. And yes, we have reduced nuclear weapons, as have the Russians. But under the New START Treaty, they can build 2,200 warheads, deploy them, including the bomber counting rules. And as the Federation of American Scientists point out under a normal non-treaty uh, Russian deployment, they probably could have 26 to 2,700 warheads. And Mark Schneider thinks that actually they could go up to 3,200. Plus there's another four or 500 warheads by the middle of next decade that the Russians themselves say they can deploy on new exotic systems that they say don't count under New START. Plus they have anywhere from two to you pick a number of five or 6,000 warheads on theater systems. So when you add all that up, you're talking about 10,000 warheads, okay? If you maximize the number of warheads the United States can now deploy over time, you're talking about about 3,200, because we'd have to build, Minuteman would have to go one to three warheads. The submarines can go from five to eight on our bomber weapons. So we don't have even any bombers deployed with weapons. So let's come back to John's point of should we do trilateral arms control. I see the arms control proposal by the president as trying to bring about some transparency in the Chinese nuclear systems. My guess is the Chinese are not gonna be transparent. And the issue is, as Tim Morrison points out, the Russians, even if they're complying with New START, which I don't believe they are, uh, the official Russian numbers are, we only have 2,200, don't worry is that they have a lot more warheads that can produce a thousand warheads a year. We're lucky if we can produce a dozen. And so therefore I think deterrence works and it has worked for 70 years. And arms control tends to send us down rabbit holes where we think if we just get an agreement with the Russians, then we can put aside our deterrent requirements. And I'd be willing to do an arms control agreement with China and Russia where, as Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify, you'd have to have very, very strong verification measures. And if the Russians and Chinese don't wanna have verification measures that are adequate, well, doesn't that tell you something? It tells you they see, as John just told us, they see arms control as a game of political warfare where they can get benefits without having to give up anything. So yes, isn't it interesting, the disarmament community in America, the Arms Control Association, Federation of American Scientists, Plowshares, Global Zero, they all give the Chinese a pass. 
okay? Chinese don't have to engage in arms control. They don't have to stop their proliferation. They don't have to not require multiple warheads or maneuverable warheads. They're basically given a free pass. And I think that says the Chinese love that. So they can continue to pretend to be for in favor of stabilizing uh, reductions in nuclear weapons or non-proliferation, but at the same time engaging in the very practices that they say are destabilizing for the world. So yeah, John makes a very good point. And Mark Schneider makes the same point. Steve Blank makes the same point. And I think we have to seriously say, if you want arms control, first it's trust but verify. I don't think the Russians or the Chinese want to go there. Good question here from a Facebook viewer, Debbie Aldrich. Is the U.S. prepared for a potential EMP attack? No, we're not. The reason is our grid's not protected. And the thing is, unless you can intercept a warhead being launched from a missile, it's very quick. Getting to 70 kilometers above the Earth's surface, launching it from 400 miles off the coast of, let's say, North Carolina, you could get there very quickly. Now, you have systems that can pick it up if they're deployed there. You could do Aegis ashore, you could do a number of things, but you'd have to proliferate missile systems, defense systems all over America it would be extraordinarily costly. The president has now mandated that we protect our grid from EMP attacks. Finally, the first president's ever done this, and he said, get with it. And part of what Peter Pry, God love him, he does is monitor what we're doing is we, if we can spend $2.2 trillion on a coronavirus uh, relief plan, we can come up with the $6 billion needed to protect our country from, uh, protect our grid from EAP. There's also the question of other computer systems that need to be protected. But if you think things are bad now with electricity at what we need it at, what if we don't have electricity? and think of what would happen. Our country, as Newt Gingrich had said, would go back somewhere in the beginning of probably the 19th century. And again, I'm gonna to have to get up and get my light back on. <laughs> Excuse me, folks. Okay. We have a question here from Robert Gay. What about China's chemical and biological weapons development? Where does it stand in comparison to their nuclear strategy? Could this be an option to its nuclear capabilities or be used by a proxy? Well, the person that you want to go talk to is Seth Karras over at the WMD Center at the National Defense University. Uh, ChemBio is not my business, but I have to tell you, when you looked at the Soviet plans at the end of the Cold War, which we discovered, they were going to lay down over Europe chemical and biological attacks first, then nuke us. And the question is, what in the name of God would be left? Now, we know Syria has extensive chemical, biological capability, as does North Korea, as does, assumption is China, given the fact that they have some of the only, there are only about seven major virology labs in the world, of which one is, one or two are in Wuhan. I have no doubt that the Chinese have fairly substantial chemical and biological warfare elements. We have no protection against our people. Uh, at large, the public at large, civilian population. Some of our military can operate in that kind of an environment. We know, for example, in my working in Korea, is the North Koreans would lay down chemical biological attacks on our airfields so that our airplanes from other parts of the Pacific could not come into that area without having chemical biological protection gear, which makes it very difficult to operate. I think that's probably one of the scariest parts of how do you verify that we've gotten rid of these things? There's the Biological Weapons Convention that I believe the Chinese have signed. I don't trust them farther than I can throw a giraffe over the moon. So in that respect, yes, that's, but I don't see any defense against this except for retaliation, which is because how do you protect an entire society from chemical and biologicals? We can't protect them. We can only protect them partially from the flu, let alone from the pandemic uh, coronavirus. We have a question here from a Facebook viewer and a current IWP student, Ivan Esparza. Part of what you have said has indicated that we need to be prepared for a volatile purpose with Chinese nuclear development. Could you comment more on how we might be able to gauge their specific intents more precisely? Would it include a more rigorous profiling of Chinese leadership? Well, here's the problem. The Chinese are not transparent. 
And there's no pressure from the disarmament community, from academia, from the entertainment community in Hollywood, or to be honest with you, from the politicians, most of them, for the Chinese to be transparent. We're very transparent. Everybody knows where our nuclear weapons are. We've known the number. The Russians are far more transparent than the Chinese. Yet I don't see any political pressure except for from this administration, yes, for the Chinese to be, which is part of their strategy on New START, is that once you know what they have, maybe you can have a better idea of what they're up to. But they don't. you don't see anything like the national security strategy of China or the national defense strategy of China published. You don't have congressional hearings. You don't have the Politburo having meetings uh, in, you know, in uh, in the open, we don't. We, a lot of this, what we see, is smuggled out of China. Mike Pillsbury is one of the few people that went out and found as many things in Chinese as he could find and got them translated. But we're way behind the eight ball on that. So, but Mike Pompeo, God love him, as our Secretary of State has figured this out. Whatever you may think the Chinese beans look like, we know they're up to no good because I can see what they're doing in the other parts of the world not only economically, diplomatically, politically, militarily. And as uh, there is a group called the uh, uh, Committee on the Present Danger slash China, which Brian Kennedy and Frank Gaffney and others have put together. I was one of the founding members. Uh, this is a deadly serious threat we face and deterrence works. And they have to understand there's nothing they can get away with in terms of using nuclear weapons or EMP against us that won't end up with them being destroyed. That's a tough, I mean, it's a tough uh, challenge. And that's, I mean, that's what we've been having to do since 1945. We let down our guard in the prior to World War II. We did it before World War I. Uh, we did it before Korea. In fact, two days before Korea, the United States, uh, Mr. Truman was told, don't worry, uh, they're not going to invade. Uh, we were told literally, I think, four days before Pearl Harbor, our ships are safe. So there are dangerous consequences to when you fall down on this uh, on the job. And we spend, what, $60 billion on our intelligence community here. Whatever it is, as John Lankowski and others have known, uh, the track record is mixed at best. And we got to stop pretending that China is going to do the peaceful rise thing and all we have to do is think of China as go to the zoo and pet a panda. Another uh, question here from Kurt Kloon, who is a doctoral student at the Institute of World Politics. Mm -hmm. He goes, what is the potential of a Russian Sino nuclear alliance? Well, as Steve Blank and I have pointed out, and Steve's with the Foreign Policy Research Institute now, he used to be head of the uh, Russian studies at the uh, uh, War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The Russians and the Chinese are working together militarily to a much greater extent than they ever have. Is there a formal alliance like NATO? No. But are they working together in the Arctic, in the Middle East, and elsewhere? Are they doing exercises together? Yes. So the chances are of an alliance is no longer a matter of rolling the dice. They have formed, a, call it informal if you want, an alliance where, and the only question is, okay, what are they up to? makes the job tougher uh, because it's one thing you're having to deal with Russia and deal with China, but what if you have to deal with them together? Plus they're friends, Syria, North Korea, Venezuela, uh, Pakistan and others. The question is what kind of alliance, what kind of work will these other countries do to enable the Chinese and Russians to achieve their objectives? Another question here from um, a Facebook viewer. Do you believe it is necessary to arm our allies like South Korea, Japan, and perhaps increasingly India with warheads in a similar footing to the Cold War in order to counter Chinese proliferation? The choice of whether North Korea, excuse, South Korea or Japan get nuclear weapons is their choice. They are members of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which prohibits them from getting nuclear weapons. If we play our cards right and have the right kind of nuclear deterrent and nuclear umbrella, there's no need for them to have uh, a nuclear force of their own. But let me caveat that. My view is what the president has been trying to do is to persuade the Chinese that if North Korea continues to build nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, and cause mayhem on the peninsula, in the words of Secretary of Defense 
Mattis, then they may risk South Korea and Japan going nuclear. That would get the Chinese attention to where they would put down the North Korean nuclear program and get rid of it. Because I think that's the one thing they do not want. If you think the United States, North Korea, China, and Russia all in the same region having nuclear weapons is a bad idea, well, add a couple more countries such as Japan and South Korea to that, and you would also have Taiwan go nuclear. So that's the danger. China's playing with uh, dynamite, in this case, nuclear dynamite. But I would not advocate, as uh, some people like Professor Waltz and others have proposed, that the more the merrier. I mean, as, as Henry Sikorsky has pointed out in his proliferation briefings, if you think trying to figure out what three other nuclear powers, China, Russia, and North Korea, are doing in a crisis in North Korea, on the Korean Peninsula, how many more nuclear forces would you like to add into that to try to figure out what's going on in a crisis? Okay, so I don't see any benefit to having more nuclear weapons in the world and more proliferation. A question here from a Facebook viewer, Jim Dolbo. How worried are you about China invading Taiwan? Very. The question is when? I, I really believe, I think this question, Jim, uh, been a top-notch national security uh, analyst, um, but I'm very worried. The question is how they do it. A lot of people, uh, there was one critic, uh, my old friend John Pike said, oh, you mean a million man swim? <laughs> this is a number of years ago when he said the only way the Chinese are going to get to Taiwan is to swim. Well, I think that the facts are that there are ways they would do it. EMP would start with uh, massive airborne attack. I'm very worried. The thing is to help, I call them the Republic of China. I think the president should call the president of Taiwan like every other week and congratulate them on their recent democratic election that does get the attention of the boys and girls in the Polo Pearl. And I think that, uh, I know it'd be crazy, but I think if President of the United States just simply recognized the Republic of China as a country, I mean, if the PLO can be, Palestinians can be an observer at the UN and be treated as a country by many of its allies and friends, why in the heck can't the Republic of China be the Republic of China? I know it's drive the Chinese crazy in the polar world, but that's the Communist Party of China. It is not, uh, does not represent all of China. We have another question here from a Facebook viewer, Gavin Stark. Where does China stand in its development of the triad of nuclear delivery systems, stealth bombers, ballistic missiles, and nuclear submarines? They have mobile ICBMs and fixed ICBMs. They are now deploying in sea trials their submarines with ballistic missiles, and they are building a strategic bomber. So they basically have what is known as a traditional triad of nuclear forces. And contrary to what a lot of some people believe that we developed the triad simply because the Air Force wanted to compete with the Navy. My view is it makes great sense. Each of the forces, bombers, ICBMs, and subs, all have different attributes. They complement each other. It makes it extremely difficult to take everything out simultaneously to disarm us. And therefore, having an insurance policy that if some technology doesn't work, you've got backup. And you've got it in such a way that, as General Goldfein, the outgoing Chief of Staff of the Air Force said the other day at one of these uh, one of my seminars, he said the ICBM leg of the United States of America, Miniman, are perfectly survivable because he said there is no power on earth that can simultaneously come after and get rid of them all, or there are 400 of them, plus their launch control centers, which I think are 45. And what's interesting is a individual writing for the Federation of American Scientists in Forbes magazine a couple of weeks ago admitted that the threat of a Russian attack on our ICBM force, a preemptive attack, uh, was zero. I'm glad to see that the one element in the disarmament community has finally decided that there is no hair trigger on our ICBMs, that they're not vulnerable, that they don't need to be taken down. But the Chinese have learned that a triad of forces is very formidable. The question is that they used it solely for legitimate deterrent forces. Okay, but that's not what they're up to. They're up to using that force for coercion and for nuclear blackmail. That's what makes it worrisome. 
Another question here from Robert Creeden. Historically, China has chosen not to participate in nuclear arms limitation talks with the West, presumably not viewing such talks as in their best interest. Under what conditions might they choose to modify that position in the future? My guess is if they saw our allies like Taiwan or Republic of China, Republic of Korea and Japan going nuclear because of the nature of the Chinese nuclear threat, that would definitely get their attention. And as a price of enforcing the non-proliferation of those three countries, all of which have signed on to the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as a price of their continuing to be uh, maintain a non-nuclear capability, the Chinese would have to join with multilateral arms control, which again, I'm going back, I'll go back to John Lankowski's question. It's only as good as the verification and the issue is, to me, is not so much the numbers, although they're important, is what kind of systems under START II, remember, we banned land-based multiple warheads. The Russians signed it under Yeltsin and George Bush 41. We ratified it in the U.S. Senate. The Duma said, nah, I don't think so, and then said, we'll do this if you get rid of missile defense and keep it in the laboratory. Okay? If you get rid of MERV land-based ICBMs, Okay, you're basically saying we're not going first. If you don't ban MERV land-based ICBMs, which the Russians eventually said, no, we're not going to sign up to that. Their systems are on alert much higher percent than ours because land-based ICBMs are almost 99% on alert. Sea-based MERV, uh, MERV systems, only about a third are at sea at any one time. We've gone to sea with our subs. We've gone to a large number on our bombers precisely because that's more stabilizing. That's where I'd like to see the United States take arms control towards more stabilizing deployments, knowing that you're not gonna get rid of nuclear weapons, global zero is not gonna happen uh, anytime before. As Keith Payne wrote in his new book, you're, you're, you're not gonna have zero nuclear weapons unless you completely change the security environment where people feel they can have their security guaranteed without having nuclear weapons or an umbrella that the United States provides. That system ain't here. Uh, the whole point of why the United States, France, and England have nuclear weapons, why Israel, and why we have a nuclear umbrella over 31 countries in NATO is why? Because they feel insecure facing the Russians, the Chinese, and the North Koreans, for example. So you're not going to zero anytime too soon. So uh, unless the Chinese see proliferation of their adversaries as how they view Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, it's going to be tough, but I think the president's right of putting that on the table. Look, when Reagan proposed the INF Treaty of zero, 0 Washington had a heart attack. The Washington Post went crazy. The New York Times went crazy. All the networks said Reagan was crazy. He was bluffing, and they said it was Richard Pearl's trick to be for arms control, but no, the Russians would never accept, or in this case, the, the Soviets. Well, we know what ended up. As Bud McFarland told me, is that in 1983, he sat down with senior Democratic members of the Senate, and they said, look, we understand why Reagan, Reagan proposed SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. We don't like it because it's going to upset the strategic balance. But they said in the same breath, it is going to bring the Russians to the table. How much longer, Bud, do we have to support missile defense to get an agreement on the INF Treaty on getting rid of their SS-20s? And Bud McFarland said, about four years which was exactly to the month that we signed the INF Treaty and got rid of thousands of warheads on SS-20s. Whether we can achieve the same thing uh, with respect to the Chinese or a breakthrough with the Russians to go beyond New START and deal with the type of weapons like MIRVED land-based missiles, I don't know. I just think, as Tim Morrison has pointed out and others, it is the right thing to do. Another question here. China has expanded their national initiative on the concept of microgrids. What do you feel the purpose of this is? You mean their electrical grid in, in China? I don't know whether they're trying to make it more survivable or what. I'm not sure about the question. I mean, part of what I understand that part of it is if you can make nuclear power, for example, people have talked about very small uh, power packs and put them on a variety of military systems. You don't have to worry about losing the grid. But my view is, 
yeah, your military might be capable of, of uh, acting, but the American population would be dead by the millions if you don't have an electric grid able to operate. So we need to protect the grid from both sun and uh, nuclear EMP. You can do the both simultaneously. It's a little bit more expensive, but there's no reason we shouldn't wake up and look, read the EMP commission reports. They both said, it's time to wake up folks. Okay, I believe that is all the time that we have. I apologize we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, I'd like to thank Mr. Peter Husey and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook. If you're interested in attending other upcoming events, supporting IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you. Anna, thank you for a wonderful job. And I thank all the people that were watching. If they do have questions, you're welcome to give them my uh, email address here at AFA. I will try to answer all their questions uh, as soon as I can. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.